welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. My librarian co-host today is Stacy. And um, Stacy and I are gamers. We talk about it on the podcast a lot. So um, we do, right? Sometimes. Depends on the guest. Depends on well, the guest. this is the guest we're going to want to talk about it with. Um, so uh, please tell everybody who you are and about the company you work for. I'm Andrew Searles. I am the senior product manager at D&D Beyond. Um, and what that really means is that um, I'm probably the one you're angry at because I didn't build what you wanted us to build. Uh, so <laughs> um, I'm the one that really is the, the sort of what should we be building and what's the most valuable? What's the thing that's gonna help us um, meet the, the needs of the most of our players? Uh, so that's sort of my job is to kind of direct us in the right direction. Ooh. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, um, we're gamers here, and uh, gaming in libraries has become huge. Um, yes. Gaming during the pandemic was sort of a, I'm going to make a pun, game changer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and all we've been hearing about are platforms and things like D&D Beyond. So, uh, I use it um, as well. Well, thank you for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's sort of our, so at D&D Beyond, that's sort of the thing we want to do is make it easier to play D&D um, and make it more fun. Um, so D&D is already a sort of a fun game and it has been for years and years and years and years. Um, but uh, the digital age is upon us. And especially during times like COVID, um, it's even more difficult to play in person. Um, and so digital tools like D&D Beyond and other uh, other tools online make it a lot easier to sort of play uh, that game with your friends while you're still at home being safe. So we definitely saw a huge increase in, in usage during, during these last year and a half. That's awesome. And um, I think we're going to continue to because uh, a lot of people who were unable to play with friends for uh, scheduling or for proximity um, have yeah. been been able to find a way to do it. I think that uh, one of the things um, that helps people kind of play together is that video conferencing tool. But what that doesn't necessarily do is allow you to sort of feel like you're at the same place with the same assets. Like it's sort of that quintessential moment when all of you are around a table and you're all on a map and you're rolling dice in front of people and there's the excitement and the anticipation. We have found as sort of observing people play online, that that sort of shared environment is lost when you play online. And so that's what we're trying to bring back is that sort of shared environment, even to the point where we want people to be able to anticipate and share in those moments of excitement or in like uh, defeat too, because that that's still sort of a moment of like camaraderie there too. Um, so that's what really what those tools do is, is help us sort of build that environment that we can recreate the table online. I'm excited. So I found out about you guys because one of my friends DMs games and he's like, oh, well, we're home for the pandemic. Let's do a campaign, the four of us. And I was like, I'm in, like, let's do it. And I was like, how are we doing this? Two of us live together because it was me and my husband and two friends. Our other friend doesn't live with us, but around like near us. And then our friend who DMs is like, I live in DC. And since it was a pandemic, he's like, look, I'll create everything. Don't worry. He's like, all you need is tntnbeyond.com. So like, I was just like, all right, let me do this. And I, I gotta say it, it was so helpful because I'm, while I game, it's far infrequent in between when I do, because my friend's suck if you're listening I'm calling you out because our campaign's <laughs> never finished um, so come on but it was very helpful like you guys gave me tools of like how to look at the different characters what different additions are like what are we doing what do I need to do like let me tell you building my character was so much easier 
than me trying to do it on the sheet in person and being like, what am I doing? What am I doing? What is this? And it's funny because Jessica and I started a campaign with um, some mutual friends and I was like, oh, so like we could use D&D Beyond. And he's like, no, we're doing like something different. And I was like, why? Why are you doing this to me? Give me, give, let me use the access that I have. And it's so helpful. So thank you for having like great product for me to really explore and have fun and, and not even just explore, but learn about stuff that like I might not have never even thought to like look into because I go down a rabbit wormhole. And I'm just like, what's this? Oh my God, this? I was like, oh, I love it. Well, well I, thanks for the, the compliments. Um, and, and thanks for the confirmation that we're, we're uh, doing, the, doing the right thing. So I think that's, that's what we're hoping to do. The, the reactions that you have are the things that we're hoping to be able to, to give people is better tools that make it easier for them to figure out the things they need as quickly as possible. Um, it used to, I, I remember, so I've been playing D&D since I was eight years old, um, which was a long time ago. <laughs> um, uh, for, for those that are out there listening, that was around uh, AD&D or Advanced D&D, which was the sort of second version of D&D. So I remember nice. playing, making yes. characters during that time period. And I remember sitting with the books, leafing through pages, taking hours to make one character um, it was a it was a process. We call it session zero to make a character and to get it started. And now we we can say that like it takes much much less time to make a character, which is great. Although it's still a lot of fun to make it, right? Like it's it just doesn't take as long to figure out all the information and everything that goes together yeah. to try to make it all happen. So um, yeah. Tell um, so could you just uh, tell everybody about um, how uh, D and D Beyond came to be um, when it started and mm. sort of how it grew during the pandemic because we touched upon it a little bit. Yeah, so there are lots of tools out there for for D and D. You can just do a quick Google search and look for like D and D tools or D and D online tools or even on the App Store and uh, get a lot of those tools out there. Um, we started in a in a time when um, there was a few tools um, out there and few of them even less had access to the actual five eBooks. Um, there were other online tools that uh, preceded us even from the actual source itself. But um, we started in sort of a, let's, let's make it easier to reference these, this material, right? So um, we started just putting that online. We didn't really need any permission to do that. We, uh, they have uh, the basic rules or the SRD, as it's called, um, is just free out there for you to play with. You don't even have to buy a book. So just look up D&D 5E SRD, um, and you can just start playing with those rules. Um, we tried to make it easy to find those rules and to navigate around those rules and to make a character with those rules. And then once we had that tool, we thought it would be really great to be able to take all the content that is the official content, the stuff that you have to buy the book to get, um, and uh, to do that, we would have to go and get it licensed. So that's what we ended up doing. A lot of, a lot of our customer base don't know, but um, D&D Beyond is not actually D&D. Uh, the company uh, Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro, those are the parent companies, actually own D&D and they're the ones that produce the books. But we work with D&D as the official tool set to be able to sell the books and then give people access to that, those books within their character sheet, and um, uh, being able to read the compendiums online. And then uh, soon in other, in other ways, like uh, in the encounter builder, you can go and build encounters and things like that. So you can use all those options within those tools and, and we're coming out with more tools regularly. So that's kind of how we got started is sort of very small. Uh, and then we, we saw, let's, let's build this thing up. We got a partnership with, um, with Wizards of the Coast and, and now we are, able to be the official tool set, which has given us a lot of our growth. That's great. Cause I mean, you brought up like how it's definitely helped with online and the pandemic and doing stuff, but even in person, like to sometimes I feel like to bring all that stuff with you, like all these papers, all this, to just have it like compact and be able to access all that. Like I remember, so I started playing D and D in college, and like other tabletop role playing games. Like we, I got into it then, and 
I just remember like going to my friend's house. I, I remember I was working here part-time at the library as a page and I'd leave, go to Starbucks, pick up my pumpkin spice latte, go to my friend's house, go in the basement and like everything's piled up on the table. And I was just like, oh my God, this is a lot. And I guess when like, you're kind of like a novice like player and you see all this, you're like overwhelmed. But the fact that you could access all this and like you guys work with, you know, the parent company rather than it's just you guys being like, oh, hey, like here's kind of some stuff. I was like, listeners can't see. I'm like doing hand motions of like, sort yeah, of shady, yeah, not yeah. shady. But <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's just, it's, it's yeah. a great thing to have. <laughs> Do you guys have like a, a an app or just the, the website for listeners so they could know? Yeah, we have, we have a, we have a mobile app that we recently have redone. Um, it has a character sheet in it so that you can, um, you don't have to carry your character sheet around anymore and you don't have to bring your laptop. You just take your phone and you can access the character sheet there. You've got all your stuff, all your spells, equipment, things like that in there. Um, and you can also roll dice as well. So you just tap on the ability and roll the die instead of having to even bring your dice bag with you. You could if you wanted to, but um, the idea is that all you really need to bring is your phone. Um, we just recently this year added in the books as well on that mobile app so that that way you can take all of the books too. So like you were saying, when I went downstairs, there's all this stuff everywhere. There are 40 books in um, uh, that uh, D and D has come out with already. Um, that means bringing 40 books that are around 300 pages. They're big sort of tomes, 40 of them with you wherever you want to go if you wanted to use all of those things. And then trying to figure out like what magical spells you wanted to use. There's not one book with all of them they're spread across many many books which is sort of annoying so this allows you to just download those books onto your mobile app and you can take them wherever you want we've had customers tell me um, they were getting deployed out to sea and they would be at out to sea for months and months without internet or anything like that so what they'll do is they'll download all of them on their tablet and then they can play DD with their crewmates as they wish um, as, as much as they want to because they can just bring those books with them without having to like pack them all into a, into their duffel bag or whatever. Um, so those amazing. are some, some of the cool, cool stories. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, this is sort of kind of talking about the expansive reach of D and D uh, because another thing we've kind of mentioned a bunch of times is, you know, when, when Dungeons and Dragons began, like a lot of people saw it as a niche. Unfortunately, it became part of the whole satanic panic. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, so it was like either like either you were going to, I don't know, be like purposely or inadvertently raising dark spirits because Geraldo mm -hmm. told you so, or you were a nerd and who wanted to be a nerd? Although these days, and Stacy and I were just talking before this interview, um, watching people play D and D online has become like a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. So go mm -hmm. nerds. Um, but uh, I I like you know just like the the fact that you're getting feedback from people who are being deployed and taking Dungeons and Dragons with them, I, and you know just talk about Dungeons and Dragons and role playing in the pandemic i think it's been such a lifeline for people um because everybody wanted to escape 2020 as it was unfolding and people who had never played before began playing in fact you mentioned you started when you were eight um we started my six-year-olds on like a children's version of D, you know, they're, they're still a little young for, um, you know, but like a D6 version of it. And yeah, we, we know that it's going to be something that they like, but again, it was like a good way for them to play out their feelings and you know, yeah. explore things when you're stuck at home. So uh, this tool is just, it's so great to hear that people are actually taking it like on deployment. Who would have thought? Yeah, it, exactly. And actually, um, so role-playing itself, not just role-playing games, but just sort of the act of role-playing has been used in therapy for years and has been used to help people overcome situations, fears, post-traumatic stress, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think that the, role, the aspect of role-playing games that kind of created the satanic panic was just because people didn't understand what was really going on. Um, I, ultimately, I think role-playing games specifically has a really interesting niche in helping people sort of overcome 
and cope with stress. Uh, ultimately, what it does is it allows you to sort of put yourself outside of yourself. Like, this is not me. This is somebody else. How would this person respond? And you can slow down time, right? So this person in this combat situation, literally second by second, this is what I would do in that moment. And you can take all the time you need. One really cool example of that that we have done, I, I have done, um, we work with a uh, company locally in Huntsville where our, our main office is at called Open Door. Um, and they, uh, they work with adults who are on the spectrum um, and try to help them gain sort of professional um, experience. And so they work with different companies. So we have people from that organization come and, and sort of volunteer around the office and and just do things that would normally be sort of a work to give them experience with that. Um, we had this really, the director of that uh, um, nonprofit and I had a really cool idea where um, based off of some research that we've seen in other parts of the world where D and D itself was used in sort of um, helping cope with uh, stressful situations, especially for uh, uh, children on the spectrum. We thought it'd be great to sort of get a game together uh, to play D and D for adults that are on the spectrum, so that's what we did. We ended up seeing that um, these these adults, and, and I'm I'm talking between the ages of around 18 to 50, around that area, were able to um, uh, they they were able to get excited about getting into social in encounters, right? That they normally would not be able to get excited about because of the amount of stress that, that would be in. Um, they were able to sort of express themselves in ways that were super uh, amazing at times. They were able to think about and how would they cope with specific situations that were presented in the adventure um, and sort of give them experience with sort of overcoming that themselves, even though it wasn't then, it was a different character. So it was, uh, yeah, as far as like pandemic goes, I, I, I think, that um, role playing has helped a lot of people sort of de stress and um, better understand how to maintain social relationships uh, without actually being face to face. And just overall, I have to put a pitch in here for it's a really sneaky way to get people to learn math and be comfortable with math. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, no, true. that's true. That's true. That's 100% yeah. true. As Jessica yeah. knows from experience campaigning with me, I'm like, wait, what am I adding? What? What's that? Yeah, what's yeah. math? That's my, the, my the tagline. Is that's why I'm a librarian because I don't do math. In the pre-pandemic times, when we would all go out to lunch together, and it came to splitting the bill, it oh, would that's come the to only thing I'm good at. Oh, yes, yeah, Stacey, Stacey's good at it, but I would always call it, damn it, Jim, I'm a librarian, not a mathematician. <laughs> but you know, just like just in general, you know, like when you're when it's part of this game, and you're you're kind of keeping an eye on everything but you also have to add things up um I think it's like a it's a really cool tool and yeah. uh, you know I've seen with my with my own kids who are learning math in school remotely like they'll be rolling their die and adding things up and then it's like a piece of cake so there's that too yeah absolutely absolutely I, I use it with my own my own kids to kind of like um get them interested in like why do I need to learn how to read? Well, you can't you can't play D and D with Daddy if you don't know how to read. You've got to be able to read your character sheet. And why why do I need to learn this math stuff? Well, you can't add up your damage to know how much you're gonna how, how if you're gonna kill a dragon unless you know how to add. And yeah. there's a whole like there's a whole sequential storytelling and critical thinking part to it. Like you know like. So and this is for not just kids. This is for adults. And this is also for just thinking through things. You know like. Stacy and I played a whole bunch of um, games in the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, and they were very quick. But as things slowed down, I think we all wanted something a little bit more in depth. Yeah. When you're, you have to think your way through things. So, like, you're in an encounter, and then, you know, do you just leave the room, or do you look around for something that's beneficial to the next part, and realizing that you know, like, go a, going like from A to B sometimes has little steps between which will either make it easier to get to see or not is just part of the whole experience. Yeah, absolutely. Like role-playing is a huge part um, of it is, is problem solving. Um, and, and actually there's a lot of um, 
close ties between role-playing games and um, improv. So if you look at a lot of the rules of improv and the benefits of improv, you can almost like marry them up to the benefits of role-playing. There was one example I was doing with my own family. I was playing, I have two daughters and my wife, we were playing um, and they were playing uh, a couple of characters. My oldest was a princess. Uh, my wife was sort of a guardian and they were out on an adventure with my, my youngest who is a five-year-old. So we just made her like a fairy dragon and she just kind of did weird things. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as they were leaving on this adventure out of the kingdom, they came across a, a boy that had stolen some bread and they, the guards were like about to punish him. So of course they stopped that. The, the boy got away. They followed the boy and realized that the boy was stealing the bread for his mother who had recently become unemployed. And so now they've, they're presented with a, a sort of a consequence of like, well, stealing is bad, but you know, this person's in a bad situation. So what do I do? What's this sort of gray area of, of things? So my daughter um, took the opportunity to figure out how can we help this woman get a job? And so she decided that because she's the princess, she's got authority in the castle, she was going to give the, the woman a job in the, in the castle. However, there was a problem. She's on a quest. It's an important quest and she can't delay. So how is she going to let her, the kingdom know that this person has a job in the kingdom without actually being there. And so now she's thinking, she's trying to come up with this sort of like problem of like, you know, how, how am I gonna legitimize this woman's sort of thing? So she, she thinks for a minute, it was really cute. She stood up and she put her finger on her face and she was just like thinking, you know, tapping her, her forehead, thinking, what am I gonna do? And then she says, I've got it. Like this sort of eureka moment. She says, we're gonna need a lot of bunnies. And we just like, what? <laughs> a bunch of bunnies. What if you've got planned? <laughs> she had remembered that she has a spell that she can talk with animals um, and that she can then allow them to sort of deliver a message. So she wanted these bunnies to come, talk with them, give them the message. Because her father knows that she has this ability, her father would know that she was the one that really sent the message instead of this woman just sort of coming up there and saying like, I'm supposed to work here because somebody said so. So then everybody, everything would become legitimized. But yeah, it was just sort of funny. And now in our family, we're just like, I know how I'm going to solve this. We're going to need a bunch of bunnies. <laughs> I love that. So two things I want to ask about. Um, I see you have a Twitch extension and a Discord um, component. Yeah, absolutely. So the Twitch extension is used primarily for shows, especially like Critical Role, where they want to show character information on that, um, on that show. So that is out there. Um, you can use that if you've got a show and you want to show your, your um, character's information. Um, and we do use Discord as well, yes. Uh, Discord is actually one of the more popular ways to communicate both over text and chatting throughout the week and through voice and sharing your screen. Um, so there is a, we call it Avre, A-V-R-A-E. Um, and it works along with everything on D&D Beyond. So when I set up Avre in my Discord channel, I can use it to roll. There's some slash commands that you can use to roll dice for specific spells and things like that. It knows who you are on Discord and the character that you are playing with um, on D&D Beyond. So it will use your stats to, to make that happen. So if I were to say roll a sneak check or a stealth check, it would use my dexterity and my proficiency from my character sheet automatically when I rolled that. It would also do that on D&D Beyond too. So if I'm rolling on my sheet on D&D Beyond and I were to sort of roll that stealth check from there, it would actually show up in Discord as well. So we, we've kind of married those two tools to kind of uh, sync up and, and share those roles across the, across the void. So yeah, that's that's a, awesome. it's a great tool for, for those looking at trying to get more involved in and in how to make things easier for everybody to see. And who doesn't love easier things? Because I'm a fan of that. And as you were explaining all that, I was like, clearly me and my friends were not using it correctly when we were playing on Discord. <laughs> but that's just us. We don't, we don't, you know, always pay attention or read through things. So it's important to read, guys, listeners. Take that. That's a takeaway from this episode. Yes, from the librarian. Read things. <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's, it's also important to know you don't, 
you don't need it. Um, so on D and D Beyond, on your character sheet, you have a game log as well. So if everybody's there, they can see the roles there too. It just makes things a little easier for you. Makes your life a little easier. So you also have a quarantine resources section on your website. Um, That's right. With, uh, yeah, um, with a lot of stuff, which I'll let you talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So the quarantine resources we added um, pretty quickly in the quarantine process. Like we saw, so just so we're all aware, like it, as soon as the sort of quarantine happened across the United States and across the world, we were all kind of taken aback. We were like moving forward with the year, going forward, and then realized, oh my goodness, we ended up seeing in one month um, around that March area, about a 30% increase in usage across the board. New users, new characters, new campaigns. There's a couple of different numbers in there, but essentially of our overall normal growth, which was already sort of uh, extended just in, in the normal times, we saw a 30% on top of that which was pretty incredible. So we thought to ourselves, how do we make things even easier for people to play online um, and get things to, to play without having to sort of like buy into it? Because at the same time, I think every, everybody kind of remembers there was also a lot of scares there too. Um, is this the economy going to be stable? Are we going to be able to, like, are people gonna have jobs? Are they gonna be able to purchase these things? They might, might have a ton of time at home to play things, but can they afford to play things? And so we wanted to try to make things easier for people. So we did a couple of things. Um, we extended our content sharing um, from three campaigns to five. And what that means is um, when, when you buy a book and you are subscribed at the master tier level, that book you can share with up to 60 people um, in your campaigns. Um, it used to be three campaigns, which would have been more like uh, quick math is 36 people and now it's five which ups it to 60 um, and that means that like you buy the content and then you can use all your friends can use it without having to buy it um, and it, it's one of the biggest values that D&D Beyond has so we upped that uh, to make it easier for you to share that around we also added a couple of free adventures that were paid for content before that um, we got with uh, Critical Role in their book there, there's a couple of um, the adventures from their books and we were able to sort of bring those out for free. Uh, Critical allowed us to sort of offer that out for free um, uh, for people to be able to play the adventures that they love. So yeah, those are the, the some of the things that we were able to do and we we're able to keep those out there for as until the future. Um, we don't, at the moment, we don't have any plans to reduce the number of, of content sharing slots. So you can still share with 60 people and those adventures are still free out there um, even after the quarantine. So whenever we have gaming related episodes, we like to ask what character do you, what's your favorite type of character? Yeah. My favorite type. Okay. So I've got, I, I usually answer this question with two. Um, and that's because I believe that there's a difference between the way I perceive myself, like what, what I would put as my character and what other people would describe me. Um, and uh, so I would say I normally gravitate to spellcasters of some kind, mostly because I love options around what I can do in an, uh, in a space. So, um, and, and uh, especially like wizards, things like that have lots and lots of options they get. I mean, in fact, they're, and, and I'm not just talking about in combat. In fact, I created one character one time uh, for an Eberron campaign. And for those that aren't familiar with Eberron, it's sort of D&D, &D, but set into sort of a magical steampunk-like world. And so there are trains that are used, are powered by magic and floating ships that kind of use elemental power to power them along. And so it's this sort of environment of, of sort of a steampunk environment. So I made a, an illusionist who, whose single career was to just entertain people. And that's all he really did. So he's, his magic was all about illusions and entertainment. I wrote four or five pages of show notes of all of this, the things that he would do in a show, act one, two, three, and then a finale. And then all the spells that he would use. And I made sure that he would have enough spell slots at level one to sort of make the whole show work. And I came to the end of that making the character in this sort of really cool show and cool character concept and realized he didn't have a single combat spell at all. So like I'm going out on an adventure without one thing, one thing that does any kind of damage. <laughs> and I loved it. It was the great, one of the best characters I, I've made. I'm, I'm, um, 
I, I really got into it because the story was so rich and it was sort of like taking a sort of fish out of water scenario, right? Like this guy who's not meant to be sort of on an adventure, putting him into that sort of adventure. So there was lots of other twists and turns that, that went along there and he eventually got some combat spells because I had to do something and it kind of represented his sort of growth. The other character that I think a lot of people, um, it's going to sound bad, but a lot of people put me as, um, and, and I, I like it, is a barbarian. And <laughs> the, the barbarian has some really interesting things. So my boss um, at D&D Beyond and I talk about this quite a bit because we all have that moment where things frustrate us. We get really passionate about something, which barbarians are very angry individuals, right? They're sort of iconically angry and they rage, right? But they rage because they're really passionate about something. They're, they're defending something. They get passionate about it. I'm a passionate person, especially around sort of what I do for a living uh, and building D&D tools. So I get angry sometimes. One of the really cool things that I find about the barbarian is, for, for those who don't know about a barbarian, a barbarian gets to rage a certain number of times a day. Um, so we'll take like a fifth level barbarian who's somebody that's experienced. They've got five rages they get at fifth level. And uh, rage is something that you would go into in combat to try to boost your numbers and to, to do more damage, to hit, hit more. It just sort of like a rah, right? But you in the rules, you can only rage for one minute. So at fifth level, a relatively experienced character can rage five times a day for one minute each. That means that the most iconic character in D&D, who is the most angry and vicious character that you can meet, really only rages for five minutes every day. And, and that's a great sort of um, analogy to me of like, how do we let our passions live and give them room, but not let them take over our life, right? And I love that idea of like, okay, I get a moment. I, I get the, the ability to be angry about this thing that happened and to, to show my emotions and to be it, but it's only for a minute. And I only get to do that five times a day. And then after that, like, I need to move on and and just be be a person again. And I, I think that that's sort of a really great thing about barbarians that I absolutely love. That is really cool. And as you are talking about barbarians, I was like, I can relate to some of that. <laughs> I'm now going to have to tell my husband, be like, guess what? Next time we campaign, I'm a barbarian. Take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be fun. That would definitely. I mean, it would because if you, if I mean, if you see my husband, he like looks like he could be a barbarian. Um, <laughs> he's, he's tall, broad, you know. But because we we always like discussing characters, so um, I'd say I typically go towards like sorcerers, wizards, and I think for like the first time when we did really like one-off campaign, I think I was a warrior once which was very out of my element. I was like, what do I do? I was like, <laughs> luckily we were playing with kids, so I didn't need to go like too crazy into it. It was a short campaign. Uh, well, you're a, you're a rogue now. I am a rogue. In our campaign we're doing now together, we're doing uh, Pathfinder. And I am a, I'm a rat folk rogue. So that's been fun to oh, kind wow. of sneak and around. I, I'm a cat folk witch and I'm constantly frustrating Stacy's character but uh, yeah. but yeah you know I I think like Not really. when you talk about like the improv and just sort of like the um you know just getting emotions out and not be you know getting something like being outside of yourself I I mean I tend to play characters that are difficult for other characters to to deal with um and one of my favorite characters ever was like a version of um Quinn from Daria. Oh my God. She was like yeah. a sorceress and was just like really superficial and would insult the enemies at wardrobes all the time, but also be, you know, like a spellcaster. So um, either people who play with me just like like playing with me or they're like, oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's always entertaining. It's always entertaining. <laughs> Well, that's the thing though, right? Like, I think we all, as we grow up, we all start to realize that even the sort of annoying or bullies or other people that are sort of negative in our lives, they have a story too, right? Like what is, what 
what is the thing that sort of makes that character do that thing? And as you start to build your own character, um, you start to understand like what motivates my character to do these things. And it starts to create interesting little avenues, right? Especially when people start to sort of, you know, get into that as, as well. And that's where the real sort of like story happens, that character development. It can be, it, it can be super rewarding to be able to play a, a character like that. So I know we're coming up on time. Um, tell everybody where they can find D and D Beyond, and um, some of your maybe some of your favorite live play channels. Because I know you mentioned Critical Role, which Stacy and I love. Uh, mm -hmm. Before, um, yeah, if you want to give a shout out to some of them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, Critical Role is obviously the sort of the thing. Um, it, it can be difficult to kind of get into the ma massive amount of content they have, but they've got a new cartoon coming out that um, allows you to sort of like pick up on the story beats um, and kind of keep up. They've also got a new Netflix cartoon that will, uh, animated series, I should say, that will come out um, soon. Um, they've been talking about it. They kickstarted it a while ago. Um, and I'm really, really excited about that. Um, but uh, I also really, really enjoy things like high rollers and um, total party chill are the two things that I would probably check out. Um, things that I, I love. There's also um, uh, some interesting podcasts uh, around, um, let's see, D&D uh, Broads, I think is what it was called, that I, I've uh, listened to and I've really enjoyed. Uh, sort of a all-female cast uh, playing D&D, which is, um, I, I love uh, to kind of see the diversity there. Um, and you can find D and D beyond. We actually do our own live streams as well with our own sort of content team that, um, ends up doing short little episodes around adventures that come out. So you can kind of get a feel for what that book is like to play before actually buying the book. Um, you can find that at, uh, D N D beyond.com. So, so just the letters there, or you just search D and D beyond in Google and it'll come up first thing. We also have a YouTube channel and a Twitch channel, so you can sort of watch us there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so once again, this was Jessica with Turn the Page Podcast. My librarian co-host was. And our guest today Andrew. was. Thank you so much. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.